is so excited to be here with Father Pietro Mercurio, who is the custodian of the Shrine of the Miracle of the Eucharist in France. And so we're going to ask him to share some insights about the Shrine and about this beautiful basilica with us. As we've been discovering on our pilgrimage, we go to our mother, and who does she lead us to? Our Lord Jesus. So it is not unusual that we have a shrine here to Our Lady of the Precious Blood and of a miracle of the Precious Blood. It's because wherever the, the, Our Lady is, Our Lord is. Wherever Our Lord is, Our Lady is. And a thought that came to me during Mass is Our Lady again at the foot of the cross. Just having the two such a thrill to be here with you. Would you tell us about Our Lady of the Precious Blood? Yeah. Uh, I would start with this painting that you see just in this small dome. At the center of the small boat is Mary. Without Mary, no Jesus. Of the church, without Mary, no church. And if we consider that because she said yes to the angel, Jesus came over here and he became man. And when Jesus died, she, he gave us his mother as our mother. This is the gospel and the history of this church starts with the, uh, with the devotion of Mary. Our Lord brings us to the city of Ferrara, to the church of Santa Maria in Vado. Father Mercurio told us that it got its name, Our Lady in the Water, because the faithful had to walk through the water to get to the church. The original church was located along the left bank of the Po River. The uh, Borgo Vado district for many Christians was a center of devotion to the sacred image of Our Lady from as far back as the ancient chronicles can tell, as the fifth century. In the Church of the Miracle, there is a fresco of a ship with Mother Mary in the middle of the boat. Father Mercurio said that through the miracle occurring at the altar of Our Lady of the Precious Blood, we learn once more that wherever the Lord is, his mother is. And through the painting, wherever the church is, Mary, mother of the church is, guiding her pope and the church to shore. Mary is in the center of the boat. It means that she is in the center of the church. Mary gives us Jesus. Although the faithful came for centuries here for her, what she really wanted was them to know her son more deeply and to come to adore her son. And so we wonder if Mary did not have a hand in bringing about this miracle of the Eucharist when devotion and belief in the Eucharist waned. You will also see angels. One is showing the way. The other is moving the boat in the direction which the Lord wants us to go. The one is actually rowing the boat, while the other is pointing the way through the Eucharist. The ongoing presence, the living presence of Jesus among us, our Lord becoming one with us, uniting us with, uh, with him, with himself. Here the angel tells Mary that through her, Jesus will, the Savior, will be born. Here is the Lord not saying to us, again through his angels, that through us we too can carry our Lord to others. The Lord is constantly proving himself as he did in this miracle that he is present among us. And so the angels guide us to our Lord Jesus through the Eucharist, which you can see in the sails. The same Eucharist that we receive each time we go to Mass. This is 
the original altar where the mass was being said and the miracle took place. At the time, it was a very small church, and this was the main altar. The painting that you see here of Our Lady of Perpetual Help was here at the time when the miracle occurred. And it is fitting, is it not? Because here we see the little baby Jesus having had, little boy Jesus having had a nightmare where the angel of the Lord had shown him his suffering, the crucifixion where he would shed his blood for us. It is fitting that at this altar, once again, he shed his blood for us through the Eucharist. This uh, marvelous church that we call Basilica, in other words, is a church with some special signs of our faith. And uh, the special sign that we have in this church is the sign of the... 1171, on March 28th, Easter Sunday, the small church was filled with devout Catholics. Father Peter of Verona ascended the altar to celebrate solemn mass before distributing the Holy Communion to the faithful, at the moment that he broke the consecrated host in two, the host turned into flesh, and from the flesh blood sprayed from the host and splattered the vaulted dome behind the altar. The miracle that took place before their eyes both, ast both astonished and touched those who were blessed to be eyewitness. Things and blood splattered on the wall, the figure of a child. When Lanciano came about, our Lord bled, and now in this, with this miracle, I looked at it, and I don't know what feeling you had. When our Lord died on the cross, we say that the church flowed with the blood from his heart. And here we see again, at a time of heresy, a time when his church is threatened, we the mystical body of Christ, I've been writing about you and calling you crusaders. Is the Lord saying that that's why you're here? Because once again, the, the blood is flowing, and this blood is the Eucharist, and the church is coming forth. And you will, like this church, rebuild the church of Christ. As our Father Pietro had said before, these heresies are not old, they're not new. They're here the way they were here in the 12th century when this miracle occurred. This miracle came to us to fight a particular heresy. Those heresies are still with us today. We still have to fight them. The battle is nowhere near over. We haven't won it yet, but the Lord is in charge. And whenever there are crises in the church, Jesus comes to us in whatever form he thinks necessary. In this instance, it was a miracle of the Eucharist. We may find that we have miracles of the Eucharist coming. And that was issued in 1197, authenticating the miracle. It reads as follows. In Ferrara, Italy, in these our times, the host on Easter Day was transformed into a small piece of meat. The bishop was called, and having verified the miracle, the citizens of that city who had been Paterini and had professed heretical ideas on the Eucharist, the body of Christ, returned to the truth. The blood on the vaulted wall was conclusive proof that a miracle had come to pass. They came, they saw Jesus conquered their minds and hearts, and they believed. If we believe, do we not help our priests to keep their belief? If you've ever been a minister of the Eucharist and people come up, I know, for example, there was one man in, in our church, and when he would come up, before he would receive, I was a Eucharistic minister at the time, before he would receive, he would say, oh my Jesus, I adore you. And there would be tears coming this down. This helps you in your belief. It helps the priest in his belief. If he sees dead eyes every time you come up to the Eucharist, if, if he can see that you're thinking about, did I park the car in backwards so I can make a quick getaway after Mass? Or what are we going to do after church this afternoon? Can we get into that restaurant to have breakfast? Or is it going to be crowded? He sees that in your eyes. And if, and if he sees death every time he hands out the Eucharist, it does not help his belief. But if he sees the excitement, if he sees 
when you're coming up to receive your Lord, if he, if he can believe that you're coming up to be in communion with God through his hands, through the hands of the priest, his belief is fostered. It's, it builds, it becomes stronger. It's just like, it's some, it's sometimes it's very difficult, especially when people are very close to you and they start to doubt the real presence of Jesus in the Eucharist. They might be brothers and sisters who've fallen away from the church, uh, they might be brothers and sisters who have never been part of the church and you so much want to tell them to prove to them the one thing that I always say do you think that martyrs died for a piece of bread so to me the martyrs are very important um, <coughs> you have to be the living martyrs of today When Jesus said that he had come not to bring peace, but rather he was bringing division, it seems as though it was contradictory to Jesus who is the peace of God, who is God. Jesus who is the source of our peace, Jesus who continually says, to his apostles and his disciples, peace be with you. Peace be with you, he said again at the resurrection, and again and again. Then what is he talking about? Why the division? Why mother against daughter, father against son, brother against sister, and on and on and on? Why the division? Because some have the ears to hear and the eyes to see, and others do not. Just as when Jesus teaches in parables, sometimes people understood and others didn't. Why? Not because Jesus said two different things to two different people. He said the same thing. He spoke the truth because he is the truth, the way, the life. But it is our disposition that makes the difference. Jesus loves all. Jesus is the redeemer of all. Jesus shed his blood for all. But some believe it and some do not. And so today we are at a shrine of his precious blood, a miracle of the Eucharist, where once again for the doubtful eyes of the people who had gathered in church that Easter in the year 1171, Jesus again proved himself and isn't isn't it something to think we should be the ones proving our love for God and God keeps proving his love for us rather than give up on us long ago God continues to pour out mercy and every mass brings us to the font of mercy to the gift of Jesus' precious body and blood that was shed on Calvary almost 2,000 years ago now. But that, brood, that blood is given to us again and again. It pours out for us in the holy sacrifice of the Mass. And the Mass is our opportunity to step outside of time and to be present to the great gift on Calvary even today and so as we come to this altar we realize that many will not believe and when Jesus talks about the divisions between brothers and sisters unfortunately we know that even in the communion of Christian churches there are those who will not believe even in the Holy Roman Catholic Church, there are those who do not believe. Even among our brother priests and religious, there are those who no longer believe. But let's remember 
where did we start? How did we begin the journey as Catholics? Do you remember your first Holy Communion? Do you remember all the preparation that you made for that day? The joy in your heart as you prepared and believed and knew that this is the body and blood, soul and divinity of our Lord Jesus Christ. Thanks be to God we had those good teachers when we were young to teach us that truth. And pray God we will have new teachers who will be bold enough, even though they will be rejected by many, they will be bold enough to teach to those who are willing to listen and those who are willing to see that this is indeed the body and blood, soul and divinity of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. It is the same mystery, the same sacrifice, the same treasure, the same gift, the same precious blood that was given to us on Calvary, in which we now participate in this holy sacrifice of the Mass. in this homily, what I would do is talk a little bit, based on the catechism, on the effects of receiving Holy Communion. The principal fruit of receiving the Eucharist in Holy Communion is an intimate union with Christ Jesus. And I think of John the Evangelist at the Last Supper. He, leaning back on the heart of Christ, is a symbol of what Jesus wants to do with all of us as he, indeed, the Lord has said, he who eats my flesh and drinks my blood abides in me and I in him. From the time we were little children, we were told that Jesus lives in our heart. As we are older now, but still at hope, I hope little children at heart, we should realize that every time we receive the Eucharist, we're deepening that union of Jesus with us in our heart. Life in Christ has its foundation in the Eucharistic banquet. <coughs> As the living Father sent me, I live because of the Father, and I live because of the Father. So he who eats me will live because of me. Christ is our life. And it goes on to say, what material food produces in our bodily life, Holy Communion wonderfully achieves in our spiritual life. Bread and the food we eat give us strength and nourishment, and hopefully joy, delight in eating them, the Holy Communion gives us those things. Then it says Holy Communion separates us from sin and it wipes away venial sins and it preserves us from future mortal sins and it's the unity of the mystical body. We who are united with Christ deepen in our union with one another. And I spoke once in one of the homilies about the Eucharist committing us to the poor and I want to put that together. The Eucharist unites us and it commits us to the poor. And I can't help but think of Mother Teresa. Mm -hmm. Mother Teresa cannot keep Jesus to herself, she and her nuns. They receive communion and they adore him in the morning, but then they go out and bring him to others and they find him in others. They find him in the guise of the poor. And we have to do that in the poor and in one another. And I was thinking, in many different chapels of adoration which I've been to, some have glorious monstrances, others have rather poor monstrances. But it's the same Jesus in each one. When we encounter Christ in others, sometimes we're going to find him in a wonderful monstrance, uh, a wonderful person. Other times we might not find him in so wonderful a person. But it's the same Christ. And we have to love and honor Christ in every human being, no matter whether they are in a beautiful monstrance or a very poor one. And I really believe that our, our pilgrimage will not achieve all that the Lord wants it to if we're not much more conscious of Christ in others and in the poor and in the unborn. It would sadden me if we would make a pilgrimage like this 
and then go home no more sensitive to Christ and others, no more sensitive to him and the poor and the homeless, no more sensitive to him and the unborn. Noble families of Ferrara wanted to build a proper church, a big church. It was only a little church when this happened. And so they paid to have a big church built. And, and again, uh, as we look around at this magnificent church, the paintings are teachings, but it also brings our minds and our eyes upward to the glory of God. And so in so doing, they were not only attracting people here where they could learn, but to focus them on God's message to them with this church. In 1,500 and some odd years, it was transported, the, the, the vault, vault was where, of the, of where the blood splattered was transported here at this section of the church. So that it would be right above the chapel and we can actually, and the stairs were built so we can actually go up the stairs to see and venerate the vault. The, the painting that you see is not ancient. Ah. On the eighth uh, 800 year uh, anniversary, anniversary of the miracle, 800 years, this painting was made and that was in the year 1971 when they were celebrating the eighth cent 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 centenary. centenary of, of this miracle. miracle. This painting was made again to tell the story. In 1990, Pope John Paul II came here and, and uh, prostrated himself and prayed before the miracle of the Eucharist. Mm. It reminds me of Fatima. Do you remember when the angel of the Lord was talking to the children and suddenly the chalice and the host were suspended in the air? What did he do? Prostrated himself. He prostrated himself. The angel who is created above human beings prostrated himself. And there were a group of people that did not believe in the real presence of Jesus in the Eucharist. So we're seeing that, aren't we? It's ongoing. As we, as we are studying the miracles of the Eucharist, every time there's a miracle of the Eucharist, what do we see? We see people who doubt the real presence of our Lord Jesus in the Eucharist. What does the Lord do? How patient gives our God us a is. Miracle. He gives us a miracle. And he proves himself to us again. Mary, mother of the incarnate word, is portrayed here as mother of the Eucharist. She brings us her son, who offers us his blood, just as he did at the sacrifice of the cross, just as he does during the sacrifice of the mass, just as he did during this miracle when his blood splattered on the arch. We see the tools used to draw the precious blood of our Lord Jesus from his body. It was by means of these instruments that Jesus suffered his passion and death on the cross. This symbolizes the one perfect sacrifice of Jesus Christ, which replaced all other sacrifices forever. The cup from which the angel gave our Lord Jesus consolation at the Garden of Gethsemane. The jagged animal bones and metal balls used to rip the flesh of the Savior and bruise his body. The sharp spur of the thorns pressed into his head, causing terrible wounds from the gashes. The cloth used by the brave woman Veronica to wipe the face of the Savior. The cross upon which our Savior was placed, the triumph of the cross, salvation through the blood of the Lamb. This lance pierced the heart of the Savior from which flowed the church in the form of blood and water. 
The blood spots were investigated as recently as 15 years ago by the Bishop of Ferrara to find that the blood is as rich in color as it was the day of the miracle. The miracle of the Eucharist of Ferrara has become a place for pilgrims until this very day. Healings and miracles of all kinds have been attributed to the miracle of the Eucharist of Ferrara.